Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 509 with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. Good to know. If it's your first time, check out the show via the YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe like leave me a comment down below i'd be greatly appreciated if you're listening via the numerous podcast apps that exist out there especially the apple podcast app then please leave me a five star review a four star review a three star review a two star review and a one star review and i'd be greatly appreciated for your support those reviews help to bump the podcast up the algorithm list when people search my name it pops up first all that good stuff i'd be greatly appreciated if you could rate this cultural comedy comp cultural comedy cultural commentary podcast the number one cultural comedy podcast as the best one as one that you're willing to review i'd be so 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 grateful and then of course support via patreon is also welcome at patreon.com for just agostino patreon.com for just agostino you get one bonus show on there every single week one bonus show for it is one pound equivalent of one dollar per month get subscribed on there join become one of my backers and supporters i'd be greatly appreciated there's going to be many clips and edits and videos coming out on there very very soon so for the first chance to see those things before they go on youtube please make sure you subscribe to my patreon please subscribe to my patreon get involved get involved support the kid loads of good stuff on there film reviews additional podcasts bonus content make sure you jump at patreon.com forward slash a g o s t i n h o for a little as one dollar the equivalent of one pound per month for full access do that today but yeah we're back in it we're back welcome back 509 the excellent singer show we're absolutely steamrolling through the episodes we're not resting on our laurels we're going bang 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 we're doing as much as possible we're squeezing all of it in into a short period of time for the exact reasons that i want to do this from the very beginning right an opportunity for me to talk about topics and things i see on the news to a very captivated and engaged audience and i couldn't wish for a better people to speak to in general because you know i don't have many friends i don't have many associates i don't have many colleagues i don't have many peers really to be to be completely honest so the best way i can keep myself sane is by talking about nonsense that i see on the internet topics that have been kind of been all over the tl which is basically turned into the town square right before you used to go to a pub or you'd go to a bar or you'd go to a community hall or you'd go to a park or you'd go to a library or whatever right and you'd hear all these stories you'd hear oh do you hear about so and so she went there he went there he crashed there that one passed away but now you're hearing it all on social media the tl the timeline has replaced the town square and it's probably the main reason why I'm against cancellation because essentially cancellation is removing you from having the ability to shout all your nonsense that you want and be a heretic in some respects in the town square, right? It's the equivalent to telling people who do that kind of, oh, fags go to hell sort of thing in, in central London that they can't do what they do. They can, but people just ignore them, right? If anything, a couple of gay guys might rock up to them in front and just start locking lips and tonguing each other down just as a way to say, you know what? You can say what you want and we can also do what we want, right? So that's the beauty of all that kind of thing and again that's the opposite of cancellation because cancellation would mean you take that guy away you put him in the back of a you know in the back of a meat wagon you tape his mouth shut with some duct tape and then you throw him in some deep well where he can't escape right similar to like the dark knight rides or something right that's what you do now, i'm not a fan of that i think in general people should be allowed to say what they want but we should also be allowed to react how we want to so if that means companies and broadcasting stations or whatever or platforms decide hey we don't want your speech on this platform fair enough but i think in general the main platforms that exist now have got so big that you can't actually have that kind of thing anymore you just can't have that let me take your voice away so you can't speak in the public town square because essentially you are kind of in a way i won't say it's a it's a it's kind of a crime against humanity but you're sort of limiting people's ability to function as a human being in the 21st century and beyond because those things are basically a part of us right our phones have become extensions of our body we've all we've all kind of have that kind of missing phone syndrome right or phantom phone syndrome where you feel like it's vibrating and it's not vibrating or you feel like it's in your hand but it's not in your hand or you feel like it's on your pocket but it's not in your pocket or you feel like it's on your person it's not in your person all these sort of things lead us to believe that we are slowly but surely being um we are sort of merging with our technology we don't have to worry about drones we don't have to worry about you know um cyborgs and flipping um ai robots we are essentially turning into them right our opinions and our information is you know for the most part um 
you know, it's, it's most part informed by what we see on social, what we see on the news, what we see repeated, what we see kind of pushed up on our timeline via the algorithm. We don't seek out information for the most of us. We just kind of come across it and whatever we see, we sort of believe. No investigation gets done, no cross-referencing, no, cross -referencing, no reaching out to independent parties, no trying to deduce and read through the actual um, articles themselves and try and pick out key points. No. You just see what you see, you read what you read, you believe it and you keep it moving. So it's no surprise that we're in a situation that we're in now. It's no surprise. But of course, here I am to be the antidote to that sort of thing. I've got a little espresso. Um, what is it, espresso? It's, an Amer it's a basically a cold Americano with a dash of, um, you know, one of those um, coffees that come in a tin, those like Starbucks things. Yeah. Which for whatever reason, you can never find those things without milk. They always say with a splash of milk, with a splash of milk. Uh, I'm assuming they can't put coffee in a tin or in a, some sort of bottle and just give that to you without it having milk in it. Maybe it's some sort of health and safety thing. I don't know. But I'd assume they must, people, someone must sell one of those bottles with no milk in it whatsoever because it's just annoying when you open it and you think it's going to be just dark, you know, um, espresso kind of double shot sort of thing, like a nitro thing. And they said it's got a bit of milk in it. It's like, oh, come on, man. But it does make this taste a bit better because I've got basically... Um, coffee granules those kenko ones chilled in here with some ice cubes and i put a little bit of that on top so i'm i'm feeling good i'm feeling good anyway jam pack show to get into today loads of fun to talk about let's just jump in on it let's not waste any more time and let's bloody go first things first it looks like the government have decided that this christmas we should be worried about covid again remember that remember covid remember that little virus right that little pandemic that was occurring in the country i think for the most part if you live in some metropolitan cities i know for mine especially in london you don't even know there is such a thing as a pandemic the only, re the only time you basically realize it is if you go on any sort of public transport maybe if you go into a, like a news like an off license you might see like you know where you go where you go to the till they have like a little thing hanging from the roof where they like selling a little mask and stuff for like a fiver or a quid or whatever that's the only time you realize we're in a pandemic or if, again if you go to like a shopping center a shopping mall sometimes security guards or sales assistants might wear a mask because they feel unsafe but apart from that you would have no idea we were living in some sort of pandemic none but obviously the government want us to um want to keep us in check want to keep us from living our lives to some certain um extent and now they're keeping an eye on supposed rising cases, which again, shouldn't be accounting for really, because you think about it, if the thing to worry, the thing to worry about really and truly with COVID should always be deaths in it. I've always thought that, especially when you think about the cases, because the cases compared to deaths are pretty, there's a, there's a real big gap between how many cases there are usually, they're usually in the thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands, and the deaths are like way way behind that maybe a couple of hundred don't get me wrong it's bad that people die but people die all the time it just is what it is why are we kind of concentrating on the cases all the time why has that always been the thing and i think maybe it might just be strictly like a um a click thing right because cases just look more juicy if you say there's been reports of 1000 cases of covid over the last 24 hours people are gonna be like <gasps> do you know what i mean instantly Whereas if you say people, 100 people have died or 50 people have died or 30 people have died, it doesn't really hit the same. So maybe it's just a purely numbers thing. But anyway, we go on. BBC News, number 10, keeping a close eye on rising cases. It says here, um, daily cases have been above 40,000 for seven days in a row with 43,738 43, new cases of COVID reported on Tuesday. Another 223 deaths have been recorded, the highest since March, although daily figures are often bigger on Tuesdays. Why? Is it Tuesday like a COVID party death day or something? My word. PM Boris Johnson has told the cabinet that the UK faces a difficult winter. Under the, the current guide, the government's sorry, winter plan, if measures currently in place are not enough to prevent the unsustainable pressure on the NHS then steps like making face coverings mandatory in some settings introducing vaccine passports could be considered as part of plan b so they're still putting off the idea of having a lockdown which I'm happy about but the idea that you have to go and carry around a vaccine passport to go into your local Weatherspoons or the idea you have to wear a face covering before you eat your chips and when you eat your chips at Weatherspoons you then take it down then you put it back on again and that's somehow going to protect you from COVID is legitimately insane we should all come to the realisation nowadays especially after all the little theatres that we were doing beforehand cleaning down our, our groceries I did it too cleaning down our groceries for one time for like a week I wore gloves when I was going shopping standing 10 you know 10 feet apart all this bullshit we were doing beforehand 
let's be honest and say it didn't necessarily protect us from COVID. What protects us from COVID for the most part was the lockdowns because we were limited in the amount of interactions we were doing with people. And it still didn't curtail the thing, right? Look at what's happening in Australia and New Zealand. They're entire, they're basically completely locked down. They are, you know, an island that can basically um, protect its borders better than anywhere else, right? Especially landlocked areas. And they've been basically, you know, they're still kind of suffering um, at the hands of the pandemic now at this very moment. So this idea that somehow vaccine passports and mask mandates are going to make any real sustainable difference is just a little bit naive, um, especially where, again, when you consider the time of year it is, we're told that winter in general, people get many viruses along that kind of time. I'd imagine being at home and not being around other people, not having built up your immune system, all these things that we kind of known, uh, you know, as we've grown up just intuitively through our parents, through little anecdotes that we hear in school through maybe teachers and nurses coming in and telling us these things that we've already known they're trying to like it's as if they're trying to memory hole it like what dsp does right dsp ducks at field would like get a thousand pound tip and then he'll pretend the next day like it didn't exist and keep begging for new tips the next day it's like no you just got a thousand if you want 150 per day maybe you should kind of divide that up into like days and then say hey i'm good for the next seven and then start begging on the eighth day but no, he just starts begging again the next day. So I think people have done the same thing or the government are doing the same thing with memory holding all these things that we've kind of been taught when we were growing up. No one talks about, Im no one talks about immune system. No one talks about um, winter season or, you know, the cold being kind of maybe a precursor or an accelerant for people getting some sort of um, airborne virus. It's not something that's been spoken about. It's just let's get the passports in and let's get the marks mandate started. And I wonder why they're pushing for stuff like that. I wonder why. Again, governmental control, right? They can't let go. It's as if they can't let go. And if, and I think some of it has to do with, you know, really tin foil hat wearing government control shit. And I also think some of it has to do, you look at somebody like a Dr. Fauci in America, has to do with the fame and the notoriety of it, of being able to go on Good Morning Britain and be able to go on all these like radio stations and talk about science, talk about virology, talk about um, public health and all these things, right? On a big platform, have your name written on the bottom with maybe your Twitter handle, your social or whatever social media handle you got at the moment, your title, right? And be able to talk about things and have people actually listen to you when they never listened to you before, right? You were the kid in class who no one cared about. Your topic that you were kind of studying was boring to most people because most people were studying, you know, maybe creative things and trying to get into the arts and whatnot. No one cared that you were going to study virology. No one cared that you were going to go to flip in um, parts of Southeast Asia and study, you know, um, medicines that can come from bats or whatever, whatever you were doing. No one gave a shit. Now suddenly now, here you are, 43 years old, single, we had no one to hang around with and now people are you know zooming you from your um, apartment somewhere in Stoke Newton and asking you on your flipping theories and ideas about what should be COVID of course that attention is going to be addictive you don't want to let it go look at Dr Fauci he's 80 something years old and he can't stop talking in front of the cameras he can't stop talking he can't stop giving people advice he's got a documentary out at the moment now on what the Disney channel talking about what did he did, did he succeed in ending the pandemic in America no he didn't it's still running rampant over there, but somehow he's got a documentary that he's basically speaking upon, like as if like he's some sort of champion, like as if he's done loads of good when there's been instances of him prior of kind of double speaking, saying one thing, doing the other thing, right? He was the one that was pushing people not to buy masks in general to, so they didn't get taken away from the nurses and shit. And then later on down the line, masks are very crucial. And then later on down the line, it's this one, it's that one. It's just like, I get it, but let's just be upfront about it and say you can't, you know, you can't let go of the fame. You can't let let, let go of the notoriety and the recognition because usually people don't give a shit about what you do because when the pandemic's over, all these people go scurry away into the laboratories and no one hears from them ever again. They couldn't even buy airtime that the way they are getting at the moment. But now, because everyone's so scared and because everyone's so worried and doesn't want to lose their loved ones, which is understandable because we all know somebody who unfortunately has succumbed to the virus in various different ways, now we all we kind of all have to kowtow that's what i don't understand especially when you look at the numbers the numbers are in the hundreds the numbers are in the thousands we got populations of multi we've got pop nations with populations in them double digit millions yet we having to kind of make all our sort of daily life decisions based on a small m minority of people who are gonna get sick and maybe unfortunately might pass away i just don't know what is going on here and again i'm somebody that went out and got the vaccine primarily because i want to travel primarily because my kind of one of my side occupations in terms of djing right it requires me to sometimes travel and go to places to play 
right? I'm going to have the ability, again, it's not travelling, don't get me wrong, but I'm going to have the ability to go to Birmingham, hope, um, hopefully soon at the end of November to go DJ soon, right? Get your tickets, link down below in the descriptions. I'm going to go play in, in, in Birmingham in November 27th. Who would have known? Maybe there could have been a time where in order to go play in a nightclub, you need to have a vaccine passport. Okay, cool. I've got my thing done already. But if I hadn't got it done, I couldn't necessarily get two jabs in time before I had my gig. So it would have cost me money, to recognition, um, the ability to play in front of a, a live captive audience. So I got it because of my job. My job requires me to just get those things. And again, my other kind of hobby is going club hopping and doing a little bit of techno tourism. That also requires me to go to various countries within the EU who have got a lot more stringent or maybe stricter policies in terms of who comes in, who doesn't come in. The only way I could get in and out and have some sort of enjoyable holiday where I'm not trying to spend too much money in terms of testing all that stuff is to get vaccinated. That's the only reason why I got it done. Only reason. If not, then I probably wouldn't have got vaccinated. I probably would have just continued living my life, taking my necessary precautions and just continued on with it. Because for the most part, I'm a fit young person. It doesn't necessarily affect me in that way. But if it did again, if I was living in a different situation, I would have got it done. But I think at this point, the people that haven't got vaccinated... I'm probably not going to change their mind. And the people that have got vaccinated are never going to change the mind of people that are not going to get vaccinated. It just is what it is. We've just got two camps. They're both weirdly patriotic or rah-rah about their points and position which i don't get it's just a needle in your arm you're not some sort of crusader you're not activist because you got a flipping vaccine relax wind your neck in but also the ones that don't get vaccinated you're not suddenly now some sort of scientist that we should be paying attention to you're also reading your stats and your information through google or through some uncle that you speak to on, on facebook no allow it i just want to move on with life that's what i want to do i just want to move on can't we just have a Christmas or some sort of new year where we're not thinking about this shit anymore? Where we just kind of accepted that this is part of our everyday life? Similar to what happened with flipping terrorism at one point. Similar to what happened to SARS. Similar, similar to what happened to, um what else? Um, the war in Afghanistan, right? Do you remember that, guys? The war in Afghanistan. I was a big deal. Everyone was caring about that. All of a sudden, people didn't care anymore. WMDs, right? No one cared anymore. Seven Sins is going to come over and flipping, you know, run a plane into the Big Ben. Everyone just kept on carrying on with their lives. Unfortunately, terrible things happened in the world on a daily basis but we have to be able to live our lives because we don't have that long on this earth if we all had that kind of timer from the was it, what is it was it um was it uh was it black mirror where they all were a watch where it kind of counted down to the day that they were, they were going to die would we really be wasting our time going over mask mandates going over talking about plan b's and stuff for covid would we really be doing that oh the Prime Minister told them the governments, uh, the Prime Minister told ministers that the government had a plan in place to steer the country through the period and that the people should continue to follow the guidance and get their jabs when called upon. Down the street said Mr. Johnson has stressed that the government's autumn and winter plan continues to keep the virus under control. Number 10 said the government was not complacent and not uh, about rising cases, but that due to the vaccination program, the levels are seeing uh, in both patients in the admitted hospital and deaths are far lower than what we see in previous peaks. Yes! And why do people say that more often? This is the most important thing. The levels we are seeing in both patients admitted to hospital and deaths are far lower than what we see previous week peaks. But we keep talking about cases. Why? Because the number's juicier. Death numbers aren't as juicy as thousands. You know what I mean? Hundreds and thousands or thousands in general compared to a couple, right? Double digits or triple digits isn't as sexier. So that's why they don't speak about it. It's annoying. The seven day average of the new COVID cases in the UK has now risen around uh, 34,000 a day after the beginning of October to 44,145 cases per day. And the number of people in the hospital across the UK who have COVID has risen by 10% in a week from 7,309 or 39, sorry, in, on October 11th or to 7,749 on Monday. The number of deaths within a 28 day of a positive coronavirus test reported on Tuesday was the highest since the 9th of March, although due to reporting lags over the weekend, daily figures are often higher on Tuesday. Now, don't get me wrong. There is some sort of, um, there is some sort of, uh, kind of macabre humor that's sort of attached to the idea of like people living their lives on one side of the, of the coin and on the other side of the coin you've got people legitimately on ventilators in hospitals struggling to breathe i think about it all the time when i go for, to a rave when i'm out in a rave pinging off my head on the dance floor sweating profusely punching the air i sometimes think to myself wow the contrast in experiences and what we're kind of living through is absolutely nuts. The fact that I've come in this place, obviously I'm double jabbed, but still I've come into this place, I'm rubbing shoulder to shoulder with loads of different people from all the different walks of life, sweating profusely, right? Living my best life. But then there's somebody else, uh, you know, maybe five minutes away from me, 10 minutes away from me, is really struggling to, to basically breathe. 
is struggling not to stress out, is struggling not to worry, is being given, you know, the prognosis that they're probably going to pass away in the next 24 hours or so. That's absolutely nuts. But also, that's life. Before the pandemic, that was also happening. But we didn't know it because we had no knowledge of it and you wasn't talking about it and we were like blissfully unaware or we tried to bury our head in the sand. We don't have a world issues going on. But now it's come to our doorstep all of a sudden, especially in the West, like we really, I think, we really kind of overvalue each of our lives in general. We always think it's, 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 it's like... It's like as if like the governments are trying to save everybody. You're not going to save everyone. Man, like imagine if you did everything correct. All the mandates you want, everyone wiped down all their flipping groceries, right? Kids covered in flipping cling film. Do everything you want. Do everything. People would still die. That's the real thing that people don't want to come to grips with. People will still die. And of course, we're trying to, you know, mitigate it and kind of lower the numbers. So we don't overwhelm the NHS. All well, that bullshit. Yeah. Go jump off a cliff somewhere but people would still pass away. That is the truth of the matter. And I, for one, I'm just done with it. I'm done. I'm not sure about you guys, but I'm really done with it. No no booster jabs for me. None of that nonsense. I'm already wearing masks on the train at the moment because I don't like... I'm in a confined space and I don't want to breathe everyone's air. And also, I like the idea of being incognito on the train. I quite like that. Like Kanye, how he's wearing his mask at the moment. I quite like that COVID's brought about this kind of acceptance with people wearing full head, head, face masks and helmets when they go into stores and shit and no one says anything. I think that's fucking brilliant, right? But in general, I'm living my life, man. And I'm living my life. That's what I'm going to do. I'm living my life. That's it. I'm, I'm not going to do anything else. I've had enough. Next on the list, we have news courtesy of The Telegraph. Steve Bruce has been sacked by Newcastle. You know, we all knew this was going to happen, but now it's finally been confirmed. After, of course, Newcastle got spanked the other day against Spurs, especially at home with the new owners watching. You just knew it kind of looked like one of those things in a, you know, in a Greek Colosseum, do you know what I mean? Where the, where, where the emperor kind of went down with his, with his thumb, do you know what I mean? And then whoever was fighting at that time got either, you know, either got spared or got executed. And it was obvious that this trial run was definitely, it was definitely a match that they had in mind to either if he had a really I think two things could have happened either if Newcastle won really handsomely or won by by the skin of their teeth they could have maybe announced that he they quit with you know um mutual whatever you know what I mean and they kind of shook, shook hands and walked away or if they got spanked they were going to sack him but maybe there was also a slight possibility if they won five nil or seven nil they could have said you know what you stay until Christmas until we get the transfers in anyway maybe or he could have just been on a one game review session all the time and again this is the one constant thing about football is change now some teams like Chelsea change far often than others but in general most teams cannot afford to keep managers who are unsuccessful especially the ones who are like trying to win stuff I think if you're a team that happens to be in the which I think is still stressful by the way if you happen to be in the fifth to the 11th place you have to ensure that your team doesn't get relegated it's still pretty difficult because a lot of those teams are quite similar in terms of levels right and obviously you're all going to lose to the top four sides so there's a lot of there's a lot of, there's a lot on the line for Crystal Palace to face a Watford right they have to kind of go into that game trying to beat each other because if they don't most likely they're going to lose their next game if they face Liverpool so those games are ultra important to get kind of points on the board and to make sure that you're kind of keeping your head above Water. so most teams i think in a league overall cannot afford a guy to be unsuccessful in any other any remit whether it's winning trophies and finishing the top four or whether it's kind of making sure that you're not getting relegated or you're not close to relegation every single season and you're providing some memorable moments in terms of you know um great goals great build up play blah 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 blah, blah throughout the season and stubris unfortunately just isn't at the quality needed anymore and i think he might be the last of a dying breed of that kind of league of manager maybe similar to like an alan Pardew, like a tony pulis guys who can't really really manage at the top level with all the needs and the kind of um, wants and desires that fans have and that clubs expect obviously with the new earners they have now they're basically expecting them to compete in the Champions League and also compete for Champions League spots and maybe win league trophies and maybe eventually challenge for a league you can't have a manager like Steve Bruce he's just not good enough for that level obviously he's good enough for the level below that but even below that now, you look at managers like Graham Potter, obviously at Brighton and the things that he's doing. Clubs now at that kind of level have an appetite to play good football, even if it is with small, with kind of lesser resources and whatever else may be of higher teams. So we shouldn't be too sad for him. And also, he got paid out pretty handsomely. So, you know, this headline here that says Steve Bruce sacked by Newcastle reveals it was hard being called a nipped cabbage head. It's like, that's the nature of the beast. I think... Um, 
the fact that a, a man, Steve Bruce Age, is kind of getting upset about what people are saying about him on social media is a little bit ridiculous, to be completely honest. He obviously doesn't deserve his family to get abused and whatever it may be. But the nature of sports, the nature of people being passionate about a team they support is always going to lead people to be a little bit delirious, a little bit out of line with the criticisms that they kind of levy against you. And it just is what it is, really. Um, it says what it is in the, in the article here. Steve Bruce has been sacked by Newcastle and has revealed that he is now likely to retire due to the strain that's been placed on him during his two-year spell on Tyneside. Bruce's departure, which was confirmed this morning, has been widely expected ever since the Saudi Arabian-led takeover at St. James Park, although he was in charge of the last Sunday match against Tottenham. He's 1,000th as a manager. <laughs> you're 1,000th. What a way to remember your 1,000th game. It's like us when we kind of mark the... I forgot what anniversary it is of the... of the flipping... Um, oh, of the Busby Babes anniversary with all that amazing kit and then Man City spanked us at home. Remember that? Like, it's such a horrible way to kind of mark such a poignant moment in our history. Anyway, it says, yeah, Graham Jones will now take charge of the team on an interim basis, starting with Saturday trip to Crystal Palace, which is going to be a tough one. Crystal Palace are really good under Vieira. Bruce's previous 99 games, um, 999 games including spells at Sheffield United, Huddersfield, Wigan, Crystal Palace, Birmingham City, Sunderland, the whole city, Aston Villa and Sheffield United, Sheffield Wednesday, sorry. And you know what's funny? All those teams have made him a multi-millionaire. They're all, you know, pretty average teams with the exception of maybe two only in the Premier League. The rest of them are struggling in between Championship League One and League Two. But he's been made a multi-millionaire managing this bevy of absolute, you know, average, mediocre football teams, right? With the exception of maybe Newcastle. It's pretty insane, isn't it? Considering how much money there is in football. And allegedly he's been paid out, what, seven mil or something? Because again, Mike Ashley in his superb wisdom decided to sign him down for... The, oh yeah, he gave him a contract extension, if I'm not mistaken, right? When all the Newcastle fans were raging that he was a shit coach, he needed to be sacked. They gave him a contract extension and basically meant that the you know the new owners had to basically pay him out of whatever contract he's in, which is obviously going to take away from what they're going to do in the future. It's just crazy management. Well, you continue. His tenure has been overshadowed by hostility from supporters who are always opposed to his appointment and criticising style of play but he leaves having accomplished his mission of keeping the club in the top flight which of course he has to keep being given credit for because I still think in my humble opinion Oli Solskjaer is one of the worst coaches in the league he might not be the worst but he probably is up there with being the worst in terms of what he has available to him to use and how we play mostly because of that because I think if you give Oli Gunnar Solskjaer that Newcastle job I think they're getting relegated I 100% think, especially if you give him a job where he has to start from the beginning of the season to the end. If you maybe give him this new manager bounce and he comes in and, you know, gives a hand, arm around his shoulder and talks about the history of Newcastle and all that shit, he might get something out of them in that regard. But if you gave him the summer, the preseason and the start of the season to start like every other manager did, he would take Newcastle down or it would be close, 100%. In a scooter interview with Telegraph, Bruce revealed that his desire um, not to expose his family to more strain is behind the reluctance to pursue another managerial post. And also, 1,000 games, mate, you're 70 years old, like just jam, brother. Yeah, I think he'd be a really good pundit, to be completely honest, but oh my God. Um, and again, he's a flipping United legend, do you know what I mean? Just relax, Steve. Um, I think this, this might be, he's an actual legend, not like Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, he's a proper, proper legend. Solskjaer's more of a cult hero. I think, you know, um, Bruce is actually a legend. I think this might be my last job. It's not just about me. It's taking a toll on my whole family because they are all Geordies and I can't ignore that. They have been worried about me, especially my wife, Jan. What an amazing woman she is. Incredible. She's just a fantastic woman. Wife and a mother and a grandmother. She dealt with the death of my parents. Hers have not been very well. And then she had to worry about what I have been going through the last couple of years. I can't take her for granted. She has been spent her whole life following me around from football to club to football club. And if I was to say to her tomorrow, I've been offered a job in China or anywhere, she would say, Steve, is this right for you? Do you want it? And she'd back me again. Yeah, people that put through there, again, that must be a love of the game though, because if you're a multi-millionaire after managing those kind of clubs and you're, and you're still willing to take your family to China to go and get more bags, even though, again, you're a multi-millionaire and you could probably get millions signing for a talk sport or a Sky Sports, just chat and shit, that definitely shows that you love the game for real. It might show you love the money, but I think more so it shows you love the game because those jobs aren't fun. You're managing a China club with no people watching the games or somewhere in the Middle East. You're doing the same thing with the teams, you know, in the low, low leagues, maybe people are watching the game, but the pressure's intense. L local local fans or those smaller teams are really, really passionate about their clubs. I'd imagine the Sheffield rivalry is not something to kind of scoff at, right? It, it follows you home, your work. You can't just clock in and clock out. And if you want to go to China, that shows you really love the game. It really does.
It says here, um, I'm 60 years old. I don't know if I want to put her through that again. We've had a good life. So yeah, this is probably me done as a manager until I get a phone call from a chairman somewhere asking if I have to give them a hand. Never say never. I learned that. Of course, the double speak is amazing. This is me done for now. But if someone calls me, I'll be in. Yeah, he's always looked older, isn't it? That's the thing with Steve Bruce. He's never ever looked really young. He's always looked kind of older than what he actually is. He's got that weird face, isn't it? Does his son still play football? I wonder if his son still plays. Yeah, I remember he was at Hull for a bit. He was a pretty decent defender. The last sentence is followed by a laugh with a wry smile and a possible grimace. At the moment, Bruce feels he's like he's done. He has, like many others before, been chewed up and spat out by Newcastle United. So, yeah. Anyway, what can you say? People calling him cabbage head. Who cares? Um, we move on, innit? Football, footballers move. Um, clubs have to change managers. The demands on clubs and things, whatever, are sky high. You can't expect to be in a job forever and ever. It's just a little bit stupid, to be completely honest. And it is what it is. Um, next of it, what else do we have here? We have, yeah, let's, let's talk about this. We have a pretty good interview courtesy of Mix Mag featuring one Sher Cheryl, 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 how, have you, is it how you pronounce her name? What do you say? Would you say Cheryl? Cheryl or Cheryl? I say, I won't say Cheryl. I think it's Cheryl. Um, a really good, mag a really good um, interview and cover story with Mix Mag. I love the pictures. There's a picture of her riding on a black horse with these bunny ears, um, um, woolly hat on, a nice kind of das dashiki sort of kind of um kente whatever sort of garb on and top and she just looks really majestic and it says the following take ownership command respect cheryl is leading the pra paradigm shift in dance music and it's good to see a platform like mix mag which is quite commercial in its appeal similar to like a dj mag featuring someone like a cheryl from what she represents and the community that she's from and the music that she plays in general because some people would say these kind of platforms do tend to concentrate too much on the business techno type of people and if we are going to change um, the industry in some way shape or form you need, to, you need to have these big publications that people kind of look at to book people or to go look at DJs to feature people who are a little bit less known but also are as good or just better than the people that they feature in terms of the business techno people in order for people to have a far better options out there when it comes to DJing because at the moment it feels like it's all the same shit right same people playing at ADE same people playing at Printworks same people playing at all these places it's the same lineup being repeated time and time after again I get it because these guys and girls sell tickets but I would like a difference in kind of just the overall tapestry of who's playing and the soundscape and the just everything, the feel and the, uh, the kind of um, the kind of aura that kind of surrounds a club when you have different sort of lineups and the people that are featured in it. It always kind of adds to it. So it's good to see Mix Mag featuring her for this cover story. It says here, Cheryl has been a dance music success story that has defined the last couple of years from Wolvenstow to Paris Fashion Week to the cover of Mix Mag on an actual horse. A self-styled speed demon has taken her chance at glory, run with it at canter, bagging viral moments, industry accolades, celebrity fans and amassing a legion of club kids who are falling over themselves to mainline um, accompanying blend, uh, sorry, to mainline her comp compromising blend of hardcore jungle DMB footwork straight into her hungry ears. And that's usually a sign of a really good English DJ, in it? Or London-based DJ. That ability to kind of melt all those kind of genres maybe a sprinkling of disco so a sprinkling of techno whatever in there too that's what basically i think makes our dj strength i think in terms of man for man woman for woman we probably have the best i would say overall in terms of their ability to kind of play a whole variety of genres like you could give a whole you could put you could program a whole night of uk only djs playing from beginning playing from friday all the way until monday morning friday night monday morning and it would be flipping majestic maybe in terms of times they probably wouldn't be able to play each a set of like four to six hours like they do in Berghain but if you gave them all an hour and a half two hours to craft a set and you hand it off to somebody else those nights would be majestic because we have all so used to having heard or played in front of or play or stand in front of multi-genre DJs who are just good at their job and don't get that many accolades so imagine the ones who are really really famous you know I mean they're obviously going to be of an even higher standard um Da, 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 da. what she says here um, I've always felt that parts of the electronic music scene are boring and safe and if I've ever had the chance I will try to change it she says da, da, da. she says here there's a big old goal there's a big old goal in front of you and there's no goalkeeper and you know why there's no goalkeeper in it because the goalkeeper's gone to, for something that's been in the wrong decision it's an effort on our team's part to get the ball into the net of the wide open goal so there was this gap in which I and other people were able to fill and now we're going through the gap how are we going to destroy and dismantle the boring parts of music and put people 
people on their toes. It takes a lot of people to be like, fuck this, do your own thing. Um, eventually, people are going to turn around and go, what are they doing over there? And that's what I've always wanted to try and do. And I 100% agree. And I think that's why I'm really a big fan of, um, what's that collective called? I think it's called Howl at the moment that I've kind of stumbled across on Instagram. They do some obviously great stuff in terms of parties. It's mostly um, queer, LGBTQ based, um, friendly sort of raves. You've got obviously the guttering and the stuff they do kind of a bit, you know, a, a, a little bit paganist, a little bit paganism inspired, but you know, we move. They do some great stuff. I think yeah, that's the one. Um, it's a it's a party series called How Worldwide. They actually make, if I'm not mistaken, lubricant. Yeah, it looks says here on the title. It says lube and queer raves um, for all genders and sexuality, which is a pretty interesting pivot or pretty interesting, um, what they call vertical for a company, right? You have like an events-based company. Maybe you do some um, casting, maybe you do some representation, whatever it may be. And then you've also got the vertical of hosting parties and then also selling lube to people who want to get down and have a bit of fun so i'm a big fan of those guys i'm a big fan of what people at Boudicca are doing i'm a big fan of what people are doing at inferno um big fan of the crossbreed crew there's another one too um fawn that do kind of um sex positive kink parties there's so many extremely good alternative i'll say again it's a bad trait and maybe a bad term to kind of describe them as but let's just for lack of a better term let's say the old kind of nights that exist and the great thing that i like about it they're now being hosted in parties like for instance there was a cross at fabric um the how was um sorry the inferno's taking place at color factory which is doing great big nights um there was something else happened i don't know but they're doing it in the venues where regular dance music folk go anyway so the hope is some regular dance music folk who would only go and see people play at e1 might go in there one day when they're throwing like a queer rave might like who's playing might like the vibe of the overall space and might want to then follow those people and become ardent fans of these djs who probably aren't as supported as well as the other big business techno ones do you know what i mean that's what you want you want some sort of parity not even parity. You want basically a level playing field. That's what you want. At the moment, there's no level playing field. At the moment, it feels like the business techno lot are earning like, you know, 50 grand per week for their gigs. And then the guys that are doing it on that kind of level are earning maybe in the high hundreds, maybe sometimes a couple of thousands, right? But the gap is too big. And I don't think the skill level is that big. Personally, I don't think so. I, I go out enough. Um, I DJ myself and I can I can kind of ascertain where people are at in terms of their tiers and whatnot, right? In terms of bands or rates and whatnot from how they play and where they are. And there's a lot of people who generally play in places that they probably have no right to play in or are there because of the strength of their productions or their net or whatever the reason is but in terms of skill level and in terms of if you blindfolded the audience and didn't tell them who was playing if i got somebody playing at flipping um caverners whatever pool club pool hall that doesn't exist anymore or i got a dj that used to dj at flipping tollers or dj at flipping um dawson superstore and got them to play at some of these venues they'll do just as well as the other guys and girls so i think that's what i'm liking to see i think the appetite is there at the moment people are hungry for it and of course with the pandemic and being a lockdown people just want to go out and have fun let their hair down shake their bum and just keep it rocking i love it i love it i love it we continue here some great pictures of course da, 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 da. There is something really magical about go, um, going to a techno heavy festival and just canning it and caning it. So and people are like, what the fuck is this music? And people knowing that they're going to walk away and go, I just type in some of the IDs and I found on Shazam. Um, the amount of people who come up to me after set and say, I'd never known footwork was before until I came across you. I never knew what 160 was until I came across you. And now I'm a footwork DJ. I'm a jungle DJ and all this kind of stuff. And it makes me so happy. A uh, brilliant. Well done to her. Um, I don't want anyone thinking that all the music that I'm part of is going anywhere just because it's popular now oh no oh no baby my job is to make that shift um stay that shit stay exactly where it is and every festival for the year future is going to be continue and book the faster tempos and genres is my personal duty and personal but then to the same time to make sure that shit is staying yeah the faster the faster genre thing is interesting because we were seeing it a lot especially with the with the crew at possessions right they play that kind of faster tempo shit and at the moment it's kind of a bit hit and miss. Sometimes it can be really good, sometimes it can be really, really shit. But I think in general, I think what we're seeing and what I like about it, especially when it comes to the people behind the DJ, before people start standing next to the DJ, if you go back a few years and you go to channels like Luca D, um, and you go to Luca D, D right, and you go to Fra909, RIP him, the great Fra909, these guys on, these guys on YouTube used to film these um, footages of, of, sorry, they used to film and take kind of video of raves before it was kind of the thing on social 
social media before social media even existed right early early 2000s and you see videos of like ricardo villalobos fenvar luciano um you know a young steph trucks and all these people playing in these amazing tech house melodic tech house kind of places back in the day minimal all that good stuff right and what you'd realize in those places especially like Sunwaves, dc10 and other places that kind of culture behind the dj booth was all vip ish it was all a bit snobby it was all a bit look at cool we are looking down at the commoners we're down we'd be on the booth we get to kind of have our own drinks behind here we maybe have it we maybe get to have a little cheeky bump under the dj table and not have to go to the toilets all this kind of stuff it kind of make people feel a little bit less than there's a bit of a separation in terms of hierarchy and also the vibe was shit it kind of i thought i think in my in my opinion i think that lack of vibe on the dance floor mirrors what's going on on stage so if you look at some of those big festivals i forgot what i wanted happens in italy where it's sort of like in an open it's sort of like an open area sheltered place it's really long i forgot where it is i think it's like something kappa something i think it's even sponsored by kappa it's really long there's many people standing behind you and if you look at the crowd everyone's just standing there whistling and recording videos of the dj no one's really losing their mind and dancing so what i think i love about this hardcore or this faster bpm stuff 140 upwards you can't stand still with that shit it's impossible to just stand in the corner head nod you have to move you know what i mean you have to you have to kind of go for it you have to kind of dance and I think the great thing about possession is that everyone that's on that, everyone that's behind the booth, everyone that's standing on that stage wants to dance, wants to lose their head, wants to actually look good on pictures, wants to actually have that viral moment of them flipping, shaking their flipping, you know, abdomen um, as the beat is going, losing their mind as their flipping pupils start to dilate and everyone kind of be like, oh my God, that's her, that's him. Do you know what I mean? People actually want that. They actually want to be seen having fun, raving, going crazy, not looking too cool and actually dancing. That's the thing I, I kind of think the lasting legacy of that that whole scene which i hope is going to continue is that we're seeing now i think in general people behind booths actually having fun because you, there's no point of going behind a booth and standing in that kind of hallowed position and having that quote-unquote vip space you're just going to stand there and look glum or look too cool for school and you know as you're rolling on flipping ketamine at least roll and then start kind of losing your mind and I, and I really really appreciate it. I think that's going to be obviously the lasting legacy that I hopefully feel with that kind of faster BPM the last point I want to make about this whole Cheryl interview which I like and which I sorry which I didn't like was the lack of mention of the important part that that boiler room set played in her eventual success now don't get me wrong she's talented she was going to be on her way anyway she was doing the work she put in the graft if I'm not mistaken she was working a part-time a full-time job was on benefits for a bit or maybe she spoke about benefits I don't really know her, her story too well precisely, but I do know that she's paid her dues, right? She's paid her absolute dues. There's no denying that. But there's also no denying that that viral moment of that other DJ, I forgot his name, unfortunately, uh, bless that guy because he got a little bit of pelters at the time when it happened, right? Which I think was a little bit OTT, but still, we understand you don't know the girl rewinding back her tune is a little bit over over the top, especially what it means, the dynamic between a man and a woman. We know, we know, we know, we know. But there's no denying that that moment basically was the opportunity for her to kind of whoosh, go up and you know what I mean that that was the, that was her flipping SpaceX um starship moment right I mean on the flipping uh booster do you know what I mean going up into the stratosphere that was it and I've always believed in general people who kind of criticize people who have licks and connections and all that sort of stuff I've never really kind of despised it because I'm, I'm a big believer in you have to be good you have to be undeniable in terms of your talent in terms of your ability and your hard work but there's no denying that you need some bit of good luck some bit of good fortune some networking skills to allow you to get to the next level and then once you get to the next level you have to then show and prove so for instance you're playing an opener at some sort of festival you know you're, you're sad because you're playing at flipping 4 p.m no one's going to be there then suddenly the main headliner is sick or did too many pills the next the, the, the day before can't come to the rave and now suddenly you've been you've been told to play the opening and to play the main set now what can you do if you're actually good and you actually rate yourself you would always had a set prepared just in case that main set came about or you wouldn't have the ability to prepare it within the hours that you have in between so that once you got the opportunity you can now show and prove so that bit of luck of that person not turning up or that bit of luck of you bumping into a booker in the toilets that is what you need to obviously get the opportunity but you still need a skill to get forward so i'm not doubting her skill but let's not let's not lie that viral moment of boiler room is what got her in everybody's public consciousness is what maybe maybe got people to be fans of her in general how she dealt with the whole issue um is what kind of maybe had the whole conversation about you know changing the landscape but whatever it may be that moment was super important but because boiler room is now the 
enfant terrible of flipping dance music because the founder is rich, which was never a flipping secret, right? That everyone knew the founder was rich, but supposedly now everyone's kind of woken up to the fact that they're rich. And because they get government subsidies or loans or whatnot or bursaries or whatnot to allow them to employ hundreds of people, right? And they've also, I think, again, no, it's just not a defense of boy room, but I just feel like there's not enough respect put on their name. Like legitimately, they are the ones who kind of, popularize this kind of live streaming of dj sets right they had all types of djs on there clamoring to get sets on there even though they knew they weren't going to pay them maybe at this point you should be paying your dj especially if you're getting flipping sponsorships by fucking red bull and shit right pay your djs at least but regardless of the, of the fact they've done more good i think for the dance music scene in general than bad they've launched people's careers i look at people like a Cheryl, i look at people like a jada g with that kind of viral uh, moment and uh, of a clip that she played i think in deck mantle i look at people even like um um oh what's his name man uh david vunk right do you remember do you know that guy he's like a he's like a i think he's a dutch dj and he plays a lot of places like dick mantle and whatnot but he's got loads of viral moments of him playing in places and being all like scatty and sweating and shit and like you know twiddling his fingers and dancing and playing really great mix of like electro techno kind of things right and he i think got a, his big bump i think from boiler room too and you know people don't put enough respect I think on their name in that respect so I would have hoped that she would have kind of mentioned that more but again maybe her career is at a point now maybe a management too don't want to associate her too much with that viral moment you want to kind of progress and kind of show maturity in a scene and you know you kind of want to be here for the long haul yeah there's a video here of David Vunk from three years ago that's nearly approaching one million views mate there's one million views nearly it's one from three years ago Addict Mantle and I think that might have been the one that kind of essentially gave him the hype needed to get yeah there's one here with one million views nearly one million 900, 900, 907 thousand let's see one, one of the one of the first yeah one of the first, I, I even got a comment there. One of the first comments says here, this was the best set in the history of drugs. <laughs> yeah. Another comment here says, God, this set was insane, refreshing and truly inspiring. Any idea who's playing at 36 minutes? Another one says here, he might be completely out of his mind, but mixing and track section is still 100% on point. Equal respect, great set and performance, David. So these platforms have definitely helped people launch their careers. Of course, they've all been talented. I'm sure David Bunk was doing his thing on the local circuit beforehand, before before anybody like myself knew who he was. Same with people like Cheryl and stuff. She was probably doing their thing in her little place that she was doing here. But let's not let's not lie. Let's say these people helped us and let's give them their props too. That's the only thing I would have liked to have seen in this article. I didn't see that much praise on Boiler Room. I saw that mention of the viral the viral clip, but I don't see that ever praise on it. And let's just confirm actually. Let's double check, but I'm pretty sure I didn't see much Boiler Room. See, look, not much, much Boiler Room talk here. Boiler Room is mentioned twice, right? And that's it. And let's see, Clip, what, what is, clip, is Clip mentioned? Boiler Room Clip duh, 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 is mentioned once. Duh, duh, duh. Viral, let's see what Viral says here. There's a Viral, what says that? Before Viral Moments, what says here? Viral Canter. Duh, 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 duh. I don't want anyone thinking of music. Yeah, see, yeah, there we go. Nothing really mentioned anymore. So yeah, big up, big up her anyway. I like the photo shoot. I think the Kara story is absolutely nang. Like she looks absolutely sick on this. Like ridiculously amazing. Legit. Like looks really, really, really good. I maybe would have taken off the hat maybe in general. I would have taken off the hat. Maybe I don't like the hat on with the outfit. Maybe I'll change the shirt. But in general, as a picture, like together, that just looks fucking incredible. Um, Great little, much better promo pics or kind of, you know, um, is it promo pics? Yeah, you'd use for, uh, or headshots for your DJing stuff, I would assume in general. And hopefully there's a couple of close-ups that you can use for lineup pictures. But yeah, look at that coat with um, that horse there in the background. That looks fucking amazing, man. Really, really great pictures. So yeah, big up her. Um, more success, more blessings. Keep it moving. You know, it's good to see um, different folk are out there doing the bits, doing the bits okay uh, let's do, make sure it's focused okay it's focused let's move on da, 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 da. what else do we have here um da, da, da. we've got this what else are we going to talk about here what else are we going to talk about um, what else do we want to talk about should we move here move down let's talk about let's talk about Let's talk about this, yeah, a little bit about this. So, uh, where is it, where is it, where is it, where is it, where is it? Yeah, this is pretty sick, right? Let's talk about this. So, this is one I want to talk about quickly. It says here, courtesy of Mixmag, Warehouse Project Punter um, attempts to get in using a fake lifetime access pass, right? Pretty epic, right? Pretty, pretty epic. I remember only one time 
I didn't even know there was such a thing as lifetime passes until I started reading books about club culture, especially places like Studio 54, Paradise Garage, the Hacienda, all these kind of things. It's when I found that these things existed, right? These cards, membership things they gave to people who basically were there at the club every single time, every single day, and basically uh, added to the vibe, maybe brought people in, whatever it may be. Maybe it was a kind of a precursor to kind of club promoters because those people in general were connectors or vital parts of whatever kind of local community or little subsect of little scene that they were in. So for sure, that was maybe part of it. But in general, it was kind of a thing, like a, like a kind of a vote of confidence, like a recognition of your dedication to party and going in the bathroom and doing mad lines right is here here's a lifetime pass for you to do as many drugs as you want in our in our establishment um for this time hence right so i flipping loved the idea and i only had one time that happened to me where i was given a card a discount card at this club i used to promote at called the alibi which was i thought at the time and still do maintain now maybe the world's best dive bar and i've been to a lot of places i've been to the states i've been to parts of europe um i've even been to parts of central america right and i have to say that the alibi 100 was the best dive bar that ever existed more so for the people and less so for the bar itself the bar was cool that's mute the, the sound wasn't that great um the system obviously wasn't the best um but in terms of the people that kind of inhabited that space it was awesome and i'd be there every single weekend thursday to friday sometimes on saturdays usually pre-drinking before i go to an actual nightclub getting crazy getting on it trying to hook up with girls unsuccessfully and you know all this sort of good stuff right and i absolutely loved it and i was given a little discount card that basically allowed you to get like a discount on drinks maybe i think it was half price or something stupid like that and then of course on top of that in order to make it sweet you'd obviously tip excessively because being able to pay for a pint and only get it for a free quid or 250 you're definitely going to give your um, bartender an extra quid or maybe an extra two quid just because you're feeling in a good mood so when i see people go to this sort of like to this extent to do such a thing i only think to myself these people are committed because usually if you to get a card you have to go to a place quite a lot right you have to be there probably i'd say every weekend for like basically yeah you have to be there for most weekends of the month maybe three weekends of the month you're always in this club so the fact that this person went to that extent to do it anyway shows me that they're really about this life do you know what I mean that they really love this club in general going forward and i like that at the end of it there's a cool little kind of um way to kind of seal it which i think is pucker so it continues this here one very bold punter managed to bag himself a lifetime access pass to the warehouse project after attempting to get in using a fake one ahead of the Adam Byers drunkard event over the weekend. The chancer used a ballsy move on Saturday, October 16th, where he showed the fake lifetime plans to security staff. It read the pass grounds of lifetime access to the warehouse project and part life. Both the warehouse project and the part life are headed by Sasha Lord, the nighttime economy advisor from Great Manchester, who again is an excellent follow on social media, especially on Twitter. He's always sharing some cool insights in terms of hospitality, um, nightlife industry, especially in this area of the pandemic that we're in at the moment so definitely give him a follow it says here at the bottom of the fake pass a message reads staff notice ensure name matches before permitting entry the cheeky punter uh, the cheeky trick landed the punter real-time access pass after lord noticed the punter's attempt and raised him for his efforts the warehouse project tweeted on sunday a new one last night someone tried to get in by making themselves a lifetime access pass of warehouse and park life caused a bit of confusion but impressive um someone tried to get in it caused a bit of confusion but impressive it says just as an update i've been in contact with the little scoundrel and i've given him lifetime access for, for for his efforts funny genius incredible right i absolutely love it i'm not sure if they had one before and then he just copied it or if it's him just starting one and making one out of the blue and the security guards being like what the fuck is this i'm listening to my life and then obviously calling somebody up and then obviously he got nabbed for it but in general what an absolutely amazing thing to see like probably the date of it opening 2017 lifetime access past warehouse project like just fucking fantastic i absolutely love it i'm um, joining the twitter thread reveler the Reveler replied to such a little tweet saying, um, the greatest PSD I've ever seen, um, I've seen oh, the greatest PSD I've ever seen. The tweet also noticed by Eric Price who replied with laughing emojis. Whereas Project um, returned a full force again on winter after being getting a green light in May, announcing that it would return with a deeper field in May and June. Um, this was subsequently moved to September due to ongoing restrictions with the lineups have included. Da, da, da. But yeah, big up Sasha Lord, big up Warehouse Project for recognizing real ravers when they enter the space. I still need to go. I haven't been just yet. I need to go visit there. Um, it's it's meant to be again one of the best clubs in the uk especially for what it has to offer in terms of scale in terms of their production um i love everything that they do about it again if you've read books on the hacienda you know those guys history you know they take clubbing and they take nightlife and they take clubs in general very seriously and from the videos i've seen online because again it's very instagram friendly for a space that big be honest they've done a really good job to kind of make it 
friendly enough to kind of capture really well in a square, right, on of Instagram. Because usually I find like the smaller the club, the more neon lights there are, the easier it is to come across looking amazing on social. You look at somewhere like a fold, right? It's got 1,000, 500 to 1,000 people kind of capacity. It's got the blinds on the left, the light seeping through. It looks better in terms of a pickup on video. But I think Warehouse Project kind of has done it at a mass scale where it kind of looks amazing from every angle you film. Maybe similar to like an E1 here in London. We've got kind of that big space with the massive wall of speakers and the lights and the lasers going everywhere and smoke. I really love what they're doing there. So big up them what they're doing again, recognizing real ravers when they step into the venue and big up the kid as well for being an absolute trooper and making that as well i'm sure that it took some effort to do and you know resourceful kids that exist out there doing the best they can and again man all these all these years all these or all these months especially years actually of lockdown have basically led people to come to the point where they're like you know what i know what i enjoy i know what i love i know what i like to spend my time doing and it's being in clubs surrounded by randoms you know rubbing shoulders with sweaty strangers and whatnot and just going crazy for some of the world's best djs and artists and producers that exist and and why not make myself a lifetime pass? Because I know I'm going to come here all the time anyway. Because again, I don't think lifetime pass gives you free drinks. It's just because that's what I always kind of liked when I was had the opportunity to get sometimes VIP entry to go in places where I was taking club pictures, right? I love just being able to go in for free so I can just kind of limit the kind of money to spend that way. But in terms of drinks, I'm buying all the drinks. I'm doing all the gear. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm doing all that stuff. I don't need any other money in that regard. I just want to be able to get in so I don't have to queue for long and all that stuff. But once I get in, I'm going to have a hell of a time. I'm going to spend money. I'm going to have a good time. I'm probably going to be here every weekend if i can get in for free like if if fold tell me oh here's a lifetime pass for fold because you attended one of the first parties and you've been going there for the best part of a year straight right then i've definitely been going there all the time but the, because you have to pay 20 quid all the time you have to decide on the venues and again it's just mostly a uk thing the entry fees for clubs are just way too expensive i think in general but big up warehouse project big up sasha lord big up the kid that obviously did it in the first place and hopefully more blessings more blessings Anyway, that is the Action Zing Show, episode number 509. I have to kind of pause it right there because I have to carry on with my life and do the things I need to do in order to progress and live a fruitful existence. If it's your first time checking the show via YouTube, you know what to do five no well youtube actually smash the like hit subscribe leave a comment down below if you're listening to the podcast app please give me a five star review or four three two one review and share it with all your mates and friends and of course support via patreon is also welcome to at patreon.com for just agostino at patreon.com for just a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe peace